threw away a whole Ready? box of them. Ready. Last thing my kids want to do is look at my scrapbooks and my script. To <coughs> I think about Oh. <laughs> no, that's actually that's you new. Through the photos yeah. on your computer. Yeah. You know, don't ever show it to anybody else. I'll no. just keep it there. You know, I can show photos of my trip. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call to order this uh, May 3rd, uh, 2018 meeting of the Capitola Planning Commission. Um, I want to begin by um, letting everybody know that this meeting is Cablecast Live on Charter Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99. It's being recorded and will be replayed next Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. on Charter Channel 71 and Comcast Channel 25. You can also view the meetings at the city's website, which is www.cityofcapitola.org, and our technician tonight is Lynn Dutton. Uh, I'm going to ask everyone, as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones, um, and when you come to speak at the podium, um, if you will sign your name so that we can have that uh, for the minutes. Um, with that, we'll have a roll call, please, Jackie. Commissioner Smith? Here. Commissioner Newman? Here. Commissioner Welch? Here. Commissioner Westman? Here. Chairperson Story? Here. Join me uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. A Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, you're welcome. You should come here more often. You'll, <laughs> you'll get to say it more. Um, Next, we'll have uh, oral communications. Any uh, additions or deletions to the agenda from commissioners first? No. Um, from staff? No additions or deletions. Um, did I understand you wanted a continuance of the, uh, of the minutes of the meeting? Please. And, okay. Um, so we'll deal with that when we get to that item. Um, and. Um, Next, we'll have uh, public comments. Uh, this is an opportunity for members of the public to address the Planning Commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone here for that purpose? Seeing none, I'm going to uh, close the public comments portion of the meeting, uh, and we'll move on to commission comments. Uh, comments from commissioners? Hearing none, staff comments? No comments. Okay. Well, let's move on to approval of the minutes. Uh, um, I've been advised that this particular set of minutes is uh, not actually uh, complete and, and ready for uh, action by the commission. So um, I'll entertain a motion to continue. Also move. Second. There's a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously, um, and it'll, that item will be continued to uh, a future date. Uh, next, uh, we'll have, uh, we have the consent calendar. This is, there's only one item on the consent calendar tonight. Uh, this is an item that will be um, held um, without um, a um, formal um, discussion and hearing, unless someone wishes to pull it for further discussion. Is there any members of the audience that would like to pull the Consent item 4A concerning 110 Capitola Avenue <coughs> Suite 1 uh, for um, more discussion. Seeing none, commissioners? Move approval. Okay, there's, a, there's a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
motion passes unanimously. Next, we'll move on to the public hearing portion of the meeting. Um, the first item um, is a design permit application for 1350 49th Avenue. Um, this is a application design permit application for a 670 square foot addition to an existing single family residence. We'll begin with a staff report, please. Thank you, Chairman Story. So 1350 49th Avenue, uh, the existing residential development is a one-story, non-conforming, single-family home. It is located in the Jewel Box neighborhood, the intersection of Topaz Street and 49th Avenue. Residential structures in the area include one- and two-story single-family homes and the Surf and Sand Mobile Home Park. The proposed first story additions include a 226 square foot one car garage and a 61 square foot addition to accommodate a hallway and the stairwell to the second story on the front of the home. The proposed second story addition is a 379 square foot living space that includes a master bedroom, master bathroom and closet. With the first and second story additions, the proposed project is 1,833 square feet, which is a floor area ratio of 57%, conforming to the maximum floor area ratio for the lot. The applicant is requesting a variance for the proposed garage to extend 13 inches into the side yard setback as indicated here. In relation to the variance request, staff finds that the following special circumstances are applicable to the subject property. The lot has a very irregular shape as a four-sided polygon with no parallel or congruent sides or a scaling quadrilateral for any geometry fans. Uh, typical lots in the jewel box neighborhood are rectangular in shape and approximately 40 feet wide by 80 feet deep. On this lot, the frontage is 60 feet wide, the side lots are 30 feet deep on the south side and 71 feet deep on the north side, and the rear lot line is 74 feet wide. The unique lot shape provides an atypical area in which to locate a rectangular garage. Most properties in the vicinity and zone in, the, in which the property is located are able to accommodate the required 10 foot by 20 foot covered parking space due to the fact that they are regularly shaped. Granting the variance will allow the applicant to enjoy the same privilege as those properties. Based on these findings, staff can support the variance request. The existing home is a non-conforming structure because it does not conform to the front, side, or rear yard setback requirements. The structure also extends beyond the south lot line into the adjacent lot. The proposed project was reviewed by the building official and does not exceed 80% of the present fair market value of the structure, so the proposed addition is a permissible structural alteration to the non-conforming structure under our code. This is the north elevation, south elevation, east elevation, and west elevation. The addition features horizontal wood siding that will be painted Coronado Moss Green to match the existing home and has white trim in the eaves. The roof will have composition shingles similar to the roof on the existing structure. Staff recommends approval of application 18-0050 for the addition to the single family home, including a variance to allow a 13 inch encroachment into the side setback based on the findings and conditions of approval. And that's what I have for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions uh, from commissioners from the staff report? No. I'm hearing I none. I want to yes, confirm ahead, with please. staff that we did receive a letter from one of the neighbors mm -hmm. um, concurring and, and approving the exceptions yeah we had three I had three neighbors come in one day together actually mm -hmm. um, and ask a lot of questions so I spent about an hour with them and went over the plans and the reason why things were designed the way they were the reason for the variance um, and by the end of it uh, one of them said he wished to actually support the project so he sent in a letter so thank you mm -hmm. and I did speak to staff and ask them about the issue of the existing house encroaching on to the adjacent property and they informed me that they had discussed this with the city attorney and he didn't view it as an issue. Okay, good. Thank you, Linda. Excuse me. Um, so at this time, I'll um, open up this, uh, the microphone for members of the public that wish to uh, speak on this item. Is there anyone that wishes to speak? Yeah, please, come on up. Um, 
Hi, uh, I'm John Hoffaker, and uh, I'm still working. <laughs> I haven't retired yet, thank you. And I was delighted when Rick, my neighbor, asked me to help him with his project, because literally I'm right across the street. I'm the main person that looks at his house. <laughs> so that's my, uh, so I wanted to do it well. It was a tricky design, and with the staff's help, we, we worked out all the problems. So uh, I think it's gonna be a good project and a good addition to our neighborhood. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Guess some commissioners didn't have any questions. But anyone else that wishes to speak on this item? Hear none, I'm gonna close the mic and I'll bring it back to the commissioners for discussion and uh, action. Um, who would like to begin? Ed? So that's, that's a really funky property and I think improvement uh, is uh, long overdue and will be welcome in the neighborhood. Uh, as far as the variances, uh, I agree with the staff. I think that uh, the uh, conditions for a variance are satisfied by this application. Anyone else? I would agree. I, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I have no issues with it. I think it's fine. Well, that sounds appropriate for a motion. Is there some? Want to make it? Okay, I'll move approval with the conditions as stated in the staff report. I'll second it. There's a motion and a second. Um, so um, I'll call a roll call vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It's not a roll call vote. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. It's a non roll call vote. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for that clarification. <laughs> well, maybe I will do a roll call vote. Uh, no, it was. Um, I think we can agree that the motion passed unanimously, um, and congratulations to the applicants. Next, we'll move on to um, item B, which is 318 Riverview Avenue. Um, this is an application for design permit for a demolition <coughs> of an existing two-story single-family residence and construction of a new three-story single-family residence which includes a variance request for parking standards and open space located within the CV, which is Central Village Zoning District. Um, so let's see, before we begin with the staff yeah. report. Uh, Mr. Ed, Chairman, yes. I, I will recuse myself due to owning property within 500 feet. Okay, thank you, Ed. Are you going to? And um, yeah, and as well. Um, I um, have an office right across the street uh, from this location, um, and I think in the, um, just to not have any uh, perception of a conflict, and since we will still have a quorum here uh, to um, act on this item, I'm gonna recuse myself as well. So I'll turn the microphone over to the vice chair. As indicated, um, we're addressing an application at 318 Riverview Avenue uh, for a design permit uh, for the de demolition of an existing two-story single-family residence, uh, and they're requesting two variances, one from the parking standard and one from the open space uh, requirement, and we'll have the staff report. Okay, thank you. So in addition to being in the Central Village Zoning District, this property is also in the River Avenue Residential Overlay District and the Old Riverview Historic District. This section of Riverview Avenue between the Railroad Trestle and Stockton Avenue is made up of one, two, and three-story single-family homes and condos. It is a dense neighborhood with very little parking, many historic homes, many non-conforming structures, and little or no setbacks between buildings. The applicant is proposing to demolish an existing two-story single-family residence, seen here, and construct a new three-story single-family residence, which includes a variance request for parking standards and open space. The existing two-story residence is 1,127 square feet, and the proposed three-story residence would be 2,085 square feet. The proposed structure is rectangular in shape with a recessed entryway on the first story and a deck on the stepped third story. The structure has almost 100% lot coverage. The proposed siding on the south elevation is cement plaster on the first story with board and batten on the second and third story. The third story deck has an obscure glass railing. 
The first story and a portion of the second story of the north elevation will be cement plaster, and the remainder of the second story and the third story will be board and batten siding. Board and batten siding will be used on exposed portions of the second and third story on the east and west elevations as well. The applicant is requesting a variance to the number of parking spaces, parking dimensions, and open space standards for the CV zone. Three spaces are required for the single family home, one of which must be covered. Interior covered spaces are required to be 10 feet by 20 feet clear as measured from the interior wall surfaces. The application includes two covered spaces that, at 10 feet by 18 feet 6 inches, do not comply with minimum dimension requirements. The project has no open space. The special circumstances applicable to the subject property are the substandard lot size and lot dimensions. In terms of parking standards, two 20-foot deep spaces cannot be achieved in tandem or side-by-side -side on a lot that is 19 feet wide by 39 and a half feet deep. With a variance for parking dimensions, however, two slightly substandard parking spaces are proposed. In terms of number of parking spaces, residences of up to 2,000 square feet in floor area are required to have two parking spaces. The proposed home has a floor area of 2,085 square feet and requires a third parking place, but a third parking spot cannot be achieved within the lot. Staff did a survey of the area and identified three residences for which variances were granted for parking based on the small lot size. Riverview Avenue is challenged with very limited on-street parking, so staff has concerns with allowing a variance for the required third parking space due to the impacts on street parking. Staff recommends approving the variances for parking space dimensions, but denying the variance for the required number of parking spaces. In terms of open space, on the small lots on the north side of uh, Riverview Avenue, 90% development is allowed without any setback requirements, and the 10% open space must be located in the front part of the lot. The proposed project has almost 100% lot coverage and no open space. However, staff surveyed the lots on the north side of Riverview Avenue, and several have small patches of open space or planter boxes, but none of them provide the required 10% open space at the front of the lot. A record search showed that most of these homes had either received variances for the open space requirements or are existing non-conforming. Staff recommends approving the variance for open space. Staff received several public comments related to the location of the third story addition and deck. We created this diagram to illustrate where the proposed addition and deck would be located in relation to the adjacent properties. The addition would be approximately two feet forward of the front third story wall at 316 Avenue and 9 feet 6 inches forward of the front third story wall at 320 Avenue. I'm oh, sorry, actually. Uh, 320 is the one on the left, and 316 is the one on the right. Staff also requested that the applicant submit a streetscape of 316, 318, and 320 Riverview Avenue to show how the proposed development would look next to the adjacent properties, shown here. Staff recommends the Planning Commission deny the variance for the third parking space and require the applicant to revise the plans to a maximum floor area of 2,000 square feet for application 18-0045 at 318 Riverview Avenue. But uh, if the Planning Commission chooses to approve this application, staff recommends that the following floodplain condition be included. Uh, at the time of building, uh, building permit application for construction within the floodplain or floodway, the applicant shall provide a no-rise study performed by a licensed engineer in which verification of the structure's impact on the floodplain or floodway is provided. That's it. Uh, any questions of the staff? No. Not right. I may have one later, but not right now. Go ahead. No, I may ask it later. We'll see okay. where it goes. So. I just have a couple, and now it's probably as appropriate as later to ask. Um, in the uh, matrix that you provided on page 59, there are um, a couple of the units that had received variances in the past that were variance better serves the zoning ordinance, and I was wondering if you could comment on what that means and what those variances were all about. Yes, those were, those were from the uh, approvals of variances in 2003 and 2006 for 316 Riverview Avenue and 320 Riverview Avenue. Uh, and I think it helps if I just read you the full finding because it explains it a little better. So the variance to parking will better serve the intent of the zoning ordinance and residential development guidelines than will the literal enforcement of the requirements of the ordinance. Okay. Uh, and that was followed up with the same uh, findings about small lot size and dimensions. So. Okay. And um, 316 and 320, I know 305 noted that it was for historic preservation. 
Were either of the other ones um, demolished and rebuilt, or were they remodeled? No, they were remodeled. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, one last question. Mm -hmm. um, at 322, there was an in lieu fee paid. Is that program still in place today? No. no. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll open the public hearing now, and uh, if there's anyone from the public that would like to comment on this application, normally we uh, hear from the applicant first. Good evening, Co-Chair Commissioners. Uh, my name is Derek Van Alstein. Um, I'll be glad to answer, answer any questions you might have. Um, I have a, a, a few comments regarding um, the request for a variance. Um, it, it very clearly the um, variances for uh, the uh, open space um, is is a I think a moot point. Everybody's used that ground space. There's very little ground space to use, um, and it's very difficult to make these these projects work nice work and work nicely. Um, <clears throat> we've tried to do that and present uh, a, a new building that will take care of the inefficiencies of the of the building that's there. We're replacing a uh, a building that has one parking space. A lot of these parking spaces are, aren't even used for parking, uh, and that's part of the problem, I think, uh, on Riverview. Um, and very few of them have two spaces. Um, the uh, and a number of them. I think there's six uh, spaces of uh, there's six projects that are, or um, properties um, that have gotten variances for very uh, for just these same reasons. Um, as as staff stated, um, and thanks Matt for doing an excellent job of putting this together. Um, there's only so much space front to back or, or side to side for that matter. So how you use it is, is, is crucial. Um, there's, there's a lot of space on the, on the first level that we can't use um, that's counted as floor area ratio. And, there's a, and, there's a, and the only thing that's, that sends us over is the deck, which is 85 square feet. So, um, but the deck is crucial because it's the only outside space that they have. So it's it's the only private out space, outside space that's usable for them. Um, as as far as the variances are concerned, they, the, the the cat's out of the bag on this one. There are a number of variances on on Riverview, um, all all for the same reasons. Um, there's. Uh, th I'm going to respond a little bit, if I may, to the uh, to the two the, to the neighbors that uh, uh, sent letters. Sure. Um, I think that the uh, the sidewall issues, um, although they may appear to be huge to them, they uh, actually being a little bit forward and and of each one of them uh, give them actually more privacy. The, the the south side is where the sun comes from primarily and what what will be blocking would be the east mostly the east light so in the morning if anything but even at that i don't think that the sidewall is blocking very much of their of their light or, or open space um, so i would urge you to to approve this um with the um cert with the uh, flood certification as, as requested. Thank you. So um, I, I had one quick question. Um, uh, on the front of the building, the garage doors, mm -hmm. um, can you tell me what those are going to look like? Because they're a pretty dominant feature on there, and I couldn't quite understand it from the plans. Well, so we can show those. Yeah, can you put those up, Matt? with the bars going across them okay. you know, I didn't want it to look like a jail <laughs> it, they look like bars because uh, this is a condensed version so if you'd seen it full size uh, those bar those black lines that you see uh -huh. are, are a lot lighter when it's full size so this is a sectional garage door it's a wood garage wooden garage door that's sectional and the lines you see going across will be almost not visible right so the door will actually go up yes. like that okay yeah. thank you you're welcome I just 
I have one thing. question, and, and, and I don't want you to give me a, a blow by blow, but can you sort of walk through, because we did get one letter from um, one of the neighbors about the construction timeline, um, and they indicated that they, they thought that it was going to be a 10-month kind of construction. Can you kind of walk through a little bit of what that timeline would look like as far as um, exterior construction versus, you know, you get the thing built and then you move inside. It's not 10 months of total disruption to the neighborhood. N no, it's not. Um, first, you have to do a surgical demolition when, when these buildings are so close together. And th I believe that's called uh, an Egyptian method, <laughs> uh, where you literally you take it down from the inside piece by piece. Um, and part of the reason that we're uh, that we're demoing this building rather than remodeling is that it's not in great shape. It was done with slump stone and uh, and uh, not adequately reinforced uh, concrete block, um, and it has drainage problems. So we're going to be able to fix all that um, with the new building. Blow by blow, it, it will take we'll do a surgical demolition take the building down from the inside um, it won't take uh, you know maybe two months to you know pour concrete and and do the exterior shell um, okay two and a half months maybe uh, I'm guessing um, and then we can move inside and the demolition will take less than a month I'm I would think so. So I think, you know, you're probably looking at, at three and a half to four months, maybe half the time okay. before the shell's finished. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I have none. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to address us regarding this application? Okay. Just decide. It's okay. You'll both get a turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's a race. Hi, uh, my name's Lars uh, Sandberg. I've been living across the street from the proposed site for 45 years. And I think there's, I should make note of the, actually the certain ca characteristics of Riverview Avenue uh, and not that stretch, particularly in between the trestles and the bridge or mm -hmm. uh, Stockton where it's, uh, it's a two-way, but it really shouldn't, shouldn't be, <laughs> it really shouldn't be, <laughs> but it has to be because of the garbage trucks that have to back in there and then go back out because they can't go through the trestles. And if, the, I'm addressing this situation because, well, personally, because of the parking and then Capitola is the biggest issue is parking and the, the density and as well as the uh, the character of, of the buildings that are, are built. And actually, the way this uh, is drawn up is probably an, an improvement uh, in what it is now. And, you know, it looks like they have a front door. And <laughs> that's pretty unusual that the, they don't have a front door for people. You know, they, but aside from that, it's uh, the Riverview Avenue is like 12 feet from white line to white line. And there's no turning around. Then uh, even though this would is an expansion for someone's pursuit of happiness or income and, or even your taxation, uh, uh, transient taxation, I guess the term is, Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a little optimistic as far as as uh, speculation goes because I see a lot of empty houses and rooms I on that street. Uh, you know, they they can't rent them because these people hire uh, you know cleaning firms, Belinda, Team Belinda, mm -hmm. and they jack up the rents enormously. Uh, but aside from that, uh, my most important concern is that I've gotten to know Nelson that lives in 320. And uh, he 
has been, sorry to, uh, he's been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. I'm sure this could be verified. Uh, you could see it, it's obvious. And his concern is the, the impact of, of all the construction. And I, I've, I spent my whole life in construction, my whole adult life. I know what goes on. This is a lot of jackhammering, uh, roto hammering, nail gunning, uh, the whole thing. And I think, I think 10 months is very, very, very optimistic in this theater where, where it's going to eventually would take place. But I'm, I want to say that the timing is all wrong. And that is my basic statement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Anyone else? Hello. My name is Nelson Vineyard. This is my wife, Leslie. We're the, the owners and the uh, occupants of, uh, I should remember this, 3, 320 Riverview, um, the, adjacent to the house under, under discussion. We did some notes today, and I'd like to just go through those in a semi-random uh, order, and then Leslie's going Leslie's to speak for a minute. As far as the uh, design uh, proposals, the the proposed living area at the top of 318 requires the framing over and finishing of a new wall. The, as proposed, the w and as, as we read, so my apologies to someone who can write better than I can, an additional four foot f for a total of 12 foot visible new wall. Such a, such a wall would effectively turn what is now a beautiful open deck area into a tunnel, impacting our light, air, view, and privacy. This is uh, the first for proposal as shown in the in the uh, in the request and it requires a variance two alternates that do not require variances at least in our mind uh, design alternate one which uh, we've done shows a dog leg design come out parallel to our to uh, our side our common sidewall and then uh, then break over and give up the additional 85 feet that you need for the for the parking variance uh, there's also another variation that you can do of that Rather than do a, a 90 degree dog leg, you can come across and go at a diagonal, approximately eight feet out, eight feet, eight feet uh, both both ways, and a, a measurement of about 12 feet in between. That would that it would really be our our preference. The design alternate number two, it um, it would give us the maintain allow us to maintain the most light, air, and everything else that we we, we love so so dearly. Um, parking variance. We're in agreement with the planning recommendation that the parking variance should not be granted. Current parking conditions on the street are horrible, and approval would only make it worse and encourage additional variance requests. As it is, we still have to park at the police station periodically, and we have had guests ticketed and uh, and towed. And we have a we have a fairly fairly small car, and we're covered tandem, you know, end to end, with about three inches left over and we have to time it very carefully and look out the front window to see if anybody is across the street because like Lars mentioned there's only a 12 foot wide um, 12 foot wide lane to lane out there and the car I I happen to drive has the handling of a blimp roughly um, so we, we get trapped in there all, all the time where we can't get out and finally we say forget it we'll just we'll walk and um, so that's we, we approve we are in concert with the uh, the parking variance. A side note, watertight. Okay. We would we would request that a water tightness test be performed by a responsible subcontractor to the uh, subsequent to the completion of of the work. Uh, that could be put in the the, the uh, job site specs for that that to be done. We don't have a uh, common wall. We have two walls about two inches of two inches apart, and we have we have been working for three years to try to get all the leaks that are coming in stopped and we're not we're not comfor comfortable with 
closing that back up without without uh, check, checking the water. And the water test involves, you know, not just squirting it with a hose. It's squirted up a few feet, then you go inside and you look. It's squirted up another few feet, then you go inside and then you look. It's kind of a long process, but well worth it because you really only need to find one leak to make that whole process work. you read okay oh logistic impacts um, impacts on the surrounding residents such as haul out deliveries start time worker parking um, resident resident parking noise dust all those need to be uh, addressed on a logistics plan which should again be made part of the uh, part of the permit um, as well as um, asbestos and lead because it's guaranteed that there's both asbestos and lead in that in that place. Uh, there are a couple of really, really good materials. They have a lot of really, really good properties and uh, several unfortunate ones. So we, we would look for that to be done, please. Okay, share the box. Okay. So we'll go to the second the second part of what passes for my, my presentation. Over the past several years, I've endured several medi medical challenges, including hearing aids, which spend any time with me, you'll know, um, which were not fully, uh, not fully successful, cataract surgeries, cancer diagnosis. Um, seven months, about seven months ago, I was diagnosed with dementia, with Parkinsonian uh, symptoms called Lewy body dementia, which is the, uh, the affliction that Robin Williams Robin Williams had about and about six months ago I had a total knee replacement surgery in preparation for the stairs in our current in our house at 320. The thing that worries me the most is the dementia from diagnosis to average life expectancy between five and seven years. Uh, uh, I, I, from diagnosis to average life expectancy is between five and seven years though I will be severely impaired before then. It's pretty horrific. We had lived off and on in Capitola for about 30 years, first in Escalona, uh, in the same apartment building as Stephanie Harlan, uh, and then on Cortez. Our three children were all born at Community Hospital, and we were married at Star of the Sea. We have uh, owned 320 for about four years with the intention of retiring here. Following the dementia uh, diagnosis, we decided to accelerate our plan. I retired immediately, and within six months, we began our move to, to Capitola. We finished moving about three weeks ago. And we were shocked to see the notice on, on 318. Just when we thought, what else could possibly could possibly happen? We we have our we have our answer. Uh, we we finished moving about three weeks ago. There are several things that I've wanted to do for years. So kind of my my bucket list. Uh, there's uh, I want surfing, stand up, which is where Lars comes in in, in part. Stand up stand up paddleboard and open water swimming. Um, I've been out there in the water every morning since since we got here. And it's not getting any warmer what <laughs> whatsoever. Sadly, my LBD seemed to be progressing faster than we had hoped, especially with regard to memory, executive action, and hallucinations, both visual and oral. I see little things scamper out of the way as, as, I, as I walk around, I see, you know. And I would, would swear that our son is, is home. Well, he's home, I know he's here. You can, there's a, a sensation of feeling, feeling that somebody is in the room with you. And uh, he, he, I keep wondering where he is. Uh, temper, hallucinations, both or, visual and oral. Temper and patience are also areas of concern. Noise, dust, change, activity, and confusion are all triggers and result in agitation and confusion, as well as an acceleration of the disease. We are very concerned that the work at 318, especially with the construction time of approximately 10 months, which we which we heard heard about earlier today, uh, will be too upsetting and something Nelson cannot endure. Nelson's medical records can be provided from Stanford if need be. Being retired, we are home during the day and separation between the two homes is one to two inches. We would, to be forced to live on top of the construction noise Nelson just left after 35 years would be unbearable and medically detrimental. Um, I retired in September after 35 years in a construction in the Carpenters Union. I was a, a commercial uh, superintendent at San San Francisco, uh, San Jose, Harvey West Park, all, all of those all of those places. I was the guy, if we had a project get in trouble, that they sent in. And I didn't have to do anything but finish. They didn't care what it cost, just finish. 
and uh, so so that was me. And now, now we had a we had a uh, yard sale to uh, be prior to moving down here, and they they took the change making thing away from me because I can't even I can't even make change. So, so if any of you need any checks, <laughs> need checks <laughs> cash or anything, um, the the options as we see them. If the work proceeds, regardless of the impacts, are we can relocate temporarily. There are several options there. We can sell our house, but no one is likely to buy 320 while 318 is under under construction. And if we we sell it beforehand, we have to let let the people know. We can try and mitigate the noise and construction impacts and limit the hours of construction as best we can. I also taught um, uh, Microsoft Project. The uh, scheduling scheduling software. I actually taught a DPR in, in my my last company, as well. So I know that we may be able to sit down and is isolate the noisy parts of the parts of the operation, and we'll be you know scare make ourselves scarce or or some, something along those lines. But I think uh, scheduling scheduling them would be would be great. Not just have the guys show up and we're here to you know bush bush all this stuff away or jackhammer this stuff or implode it. Um, so, thankfully, at least on my part, that's all that I was going to get back. Now my charming wife. Oh, and my brother lives on 47th, if anybody. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leslie Vineyard. And, um, Yes, and looking at this, Riverview is a very impacted street as far as parking goes. And yeah, part, part of that is that variances have been granted. A lot of it is that it's so close to the village and there's a lot of different people parking there. Um, we are one of the homes that got a variance, but oddly, even though our square footage, I don't, even how you calculate it with the garage, was it 1,600 something? It was well under 2,000. But at the time we got our variance, three parking spaces were required. We have two covered. Um, so it is, we, we support staff's recommendation of not approving the parking variance. I think they're over by 85 square feet. That's a pretty straightforward redesign. Um, if if there is a redesign, we would recommend pulling that deck back or there, where they're constructing the wall on the third story, pull it back even with our deck area. The wall is going to be, yes, block off our deck instead of it being open, we'll have a wall there. And we would, rec we would like to see that be, be also the, the wood, wood, um, wood instead of a concrete wall and um, and uh, would like to see it actually painted our color so it looked more like blending with our property. But um, so yeah, the, the variance. And, and I think that if you approve a variance, it is going to encourage other applicants to apply for variances also. And I think at some point it has to stop because the variance is may have contributed to the problem that's there. I mean, uh, not even all the homes are occupied and that parking is, is impossible. I mean, we, we don't go out because if we have a space on the street, we don't wanna lose it because right now we can't get in, moving in, we, we can't get two parking spaces to, in. To put it into perspective, we're seriously considering buying a smart car. We are gonna get a smart yeah. car, <laughs> yeah. Despite the fact that someone we know may see us. <laughs> They're embarrassing, but um, yeah. So um, I think our our main concern. I mean, it would. There's a lot of things. It would be nice to see some architectural relief in the design, other than a kind of a flat box type that that are coming in. But I think our main concern is that when when we got Nelson's diagnosis, I mean. It wasn't 24 hours and he, he retired. He turned in his notice at work. We came down here. We were a, on a busy street. We wanted the quiet, the beach, you know, be able to walk to the beach, have it quiet. 
we are yes an inch or two this this construction is it will be in our living room uh, against our bedroom wall <laughs> you know it's um, and we're home we're not we're not gone eight nine hours a day at work we're home so it's it's really an impact it's going to 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 be very detrimental to Nelson with his condition I mean he sniffs now with all the dust that's just gonna go crazy and after exertion he needs to nap I mean you can't nap with construction in the morning our the back alley is where I uh, the workers will have to come because the front there's no room that's right under our bedroom window you hear them talking I mean you can hear anybody talking now you know that that's back there so it's 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 really going to be quite a high impact that we to our life I mean <laughs> that um, what we were looking for and I mean I I'm really stymied on what can be done about that we can you know we request that the hours be cut down closer to nine to six that the construction is almost secondary to uh, how it's going to impact our living situation so so I don't know <laughs> thank you very much for your comments and we'll take them into consideration thank you is this yours? so is there anyone else in the public who'd like to speak on this item if not I will bring it back to the Commission um, seems like we have a number of different issues do we want to deal with them one by one do we want to tackle it all at once how would what would be your preference we, I don't mind doing it one by one want to do open space and then uh, right because there are a couple parking. of them for me I mean right we can hear from for me it's um, the, the big thing is really demolishing an existing building and building it back up with variances in one of the tightest yeah can you leave that one up one of the back one the pictures oh sorry that one um the capitola village and the riverview avenue area between stockton and the trestle is really the heart of the community there's a lot of historic homes down there that make it a very quaint um, area but it's also over the last few years really become a vacation rental zone with a yes, lot more has. traffic than it has had in the past so we have opportunities to make the parking better um, having a fully enclosed tandem two-car garage that's substandard does not encourage a lot of parking so I have an issue with that but in my tenure on this commission we've also tried to find ways to have some kind of landscaping in in the front and whether you call it open space or whether you call it landscaping I think there should be some and when you tear down the building and start over from scratch it seems like there's more of an opportunity to do some of those things than um, you know you're always gonna see and I just hate approving a design that doesn't provide for any of them so why don't we start with the parking uh, uh, you know we've we've all looked at the plans we've looked at the dimensions on the lot and clearly um, there's no way that you can get two standard parking spaces on that property I mean even if nothing is built on that property uh, there's no way to fit two right. standard parking places and for me we do allow um, you know compact spaces even in our commercial district uh, the 18 and a half feet and um, uh, I I could live with the um, you know the two substandard parking spaces because we are getting two parking spaces um, probably would want to include a condition that you know that garage area be used for parking 
uh, of vehicles, not for, for other activities. Um, but if we could, could add sort of that condition in there, then, you know, I can, I, I, I sort of feel like I can live with the two substandard parking spaces because that's all we can get and it's better than what's there right now which is one parking space would you require the reduction so that the requirement is two spaces and we're issuing a variance for the substandard I would size not, or I, no? i'm i'm not in favor of the variance for the extra 85 square feet i do think it, the project needs to conform to you know the requirements that we have if you have two parking spaces this is, you know, you can build the 2,000 square feet. So the variance then is for the, su the width. standard size and not of the, an the parking spaces, but not for any additional square footage. So I could agree with yeah. that. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm pretty much in line with that. I, I have no issue with the, uh, the two reduced size uh, parking spots, reduce them to the 18 foot 6 inches. Um, the difficulty comes to me, and this really for me comes down to consistency with the way we look at variances. Um, and I, I, we've had a couple of issues recently where that deck space, the Fleurier ratio is, even though it's so small and almost insignificant, we've denied projects. And um, because of that, I think I would have difficulty passing the 85 um, square foot uh, variance for the third parking spot although I think there's some alternatives that are open to them to to get by that but um, I would agree with the two parking spots reducing the size uh, I could approve that variance I, I don't think at this point I could allow the third variance with the uh, 85 square feet additional 85 square feet okay so the other variance is <coughs> for the open space and um, you know, I um, I'll I'll be honest, Commissioner Smith. I I had the same feeling that you had, and then I I walked down Riverview Avenue this afternoon and looked at it one more time, and um, you know the the little bit of landscaping that's there, and I don't mean to offend anyone who lives there. Um, is always in disrepair partly because it's so narrow so constrained you know people break off their plants they the cars back into them it's 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 a difficult place and i i kept looking at it trying to figure out what would be you know sort of a viable open space landscaping that would contribute to the street and, and I didn't come up with anything, but you know, I'm, I'm open to suggestions or ideas that, that you might have. And I, I did the same thing. I walked the neighborhood and I've, I've looked at some of the other projects that we've approved that we've required some kind of planter boxes or something like that in the front. And I agree with you that a lot of them are, are not kept. Um, I mean, do we want to do something like, you know, ask them to, you know, put planter boxes on the front of the building, put planter, I mean, um, what, what were you thinking? Can you go of? back to the, the um, elevation sketch that shows the three? There you go. But I mean, before we get too far down the path, let me, again, I'm going to go back to consistency because it wasn't too long ago this commission approved a project about one two four stores four four or five houses down and and uh, actually mr norton did a, a great job of designing that house a little more room to work with but we actually not only gave him a variance to not have that those uh plantings there but we also approved the neighbor whose trees were leaning over into that project to cut them down so on that same street a few houses down we approved the variance for um, uh, not having these type of plantings. And I think uh, Commissioner Westman makes a great point that this, this area just doesn't allow that, although it does allow for plants maybe on deck space or open space above that. That street, and, and uh, God bless Lars, he, he left already, but um, 
awesome guy. If you have a man taking you surfing, you're doing great because he, he's a <laughs> he's a good man. I don't I don't even know him till tonight. But I I was walking down there today, and there had to be a person doing 30 miles an hour down that that street, um, which if uh, anybody knows me in my neighborhood, I yell at people for speeding, and it's probably four times as wide as your street. So um, that street is so narrow, I think putting anything in the street is an obstacle, has potential for damage. And so for me, I, I would be open to letting the uh, applicant figure out planting and plants. And and uh, I happen to know that Derek has a, uh, a, 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 some, a knack for doing some of those pl type of planting. So. I'm I am open to the variance of um, approving that variance of the open space myself. When you look at the three, you know, right next to each other, they they all have the same issue, and I don't see and I couldn't come up with a place to put it either. So I would reluctantly have to agree um, with that variance simply because I don't think it's like. You can't put two cars, two s parking spaces there. You really can't put any open space in the front. So um, I know that <coughs> our planning department uh, does require that um, there be some sort of logistical plan as far as uh, which is part of the building permit and it will regard the parking of the construction vehicles where they're going to be um, you know how those deliveries are going to be made and I know the building department is very efficient about um, dealing with demolition and whether or not there are any kind of hazardous materials and uh, they bring in special people to um, um, take care of, of those issues so if they do find uh, anything like asbestos in the building um, you know that demolition will be managed uh, quite closely uh, and not under city regulations but under state and federal regulations um, the um, uh, the, the one issue and uh, I, I wanted if the Commission agrees to um, ask Mr. Van Alstine to come back to the podium was that the neighbors next door requested that the uh, wall that's that's mm -hmm. going to be built um, you know if that could be modified and be a, a wood uh, faced wall um, or if it could you know be painted to um, go into um, uh, match there and I, I'm, I'm assuming that that's acceptable uh, to the applicant to work with the neighbors and the planning staff to uh, on the materials of that wall that will be facing them upstairs <coughs> uh, just briefly just briefly um, yeah I think I think my client would be uh, more than amenable to uh, working with both neighbors on both sides not only that but working with with hours and and um, reducing noise and dust and whatever we can do um, and th the other thing is that I, I I think that the way that this is proceeding right now the uh, we're not even looking at doing anything during the summer period well, it would you know we're looking at, at doing something much later on so that we're not impacting the neighborhood it, you have to get in and get out and get the heavy stuff done it during the winter so well well there's and, and I do factor. think we would add a condition to it that uh, you're required to notify the neighbors when you're going to start construction so they're they're aware of when the demolition is going to take place you bet and I we, uh, we'd be glad to do that yeah, yeah. thank you um, uh, I know that the city has hours we regulate the hours of construction and uh, if memory serves me correctly and can, staff can correct me if I'm wrong I believe that the construction hours that we have are from 8 a.m. in the morning until 6 at night is that correct no um, so construction hours are Monday through Friday 7:30 a.m. to 9 p.m and Saturday 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And here is the standard of the code. So Monday through Friday, 7.30 a.m. to 9, 
and Saturday 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. No hours on site. And the way that it's written, it's, you know, noise is prohibited between 9 p.m. and 7.30 a.m. And right. so construction runs between 7.30 and 9. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if the applicant could agree to perhaps having the construction end at 6 o'clock at night rather than so there is no... Uh, you know, going into the nighttime with construction, they would be amenable to us adding that condition to um, help out the neighborhood. Because this is a neighborhood where people are living very closely together. And so I think that makes, that, that would be reasonable. Um, Commissioner you know Westman, I, I, I almost would ask maybe that the applicant work with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Vineyard on on what would help <coughs> in the process and um, you know in saying that I, I I'm first I'm very empathetic to the situation and and my hopes are that you get many surfing days out there with Laura so uh, enjoy as much as you can I also believe homeowners have certain rights and, and you had rights to raise your house up and do your house and and I think um, this applicant has the same type of rights but given the situation I, and we've done some interesting things on this commission. If we remember Ike's tree that we gave some, we, we, we just made some different conditions based on individuals in our community. And, and I would ask that maybe the applicant work, we do have hours that are designated, but um, maybe above and beyond what we're putting in our conditions that you work with Mr. and Mrs. Vineyard on trying to work out something that, uh, that allows you to do your job and build a house, um, but at the same time maybe works with them and uh, in the process, so that's just a request, not a. And if I no, could I just think that's an ex excellent request. Yeah. Um, and I could just throw out there: I know that my husband and I did construction on a couple of houses, and we had some neighbors that we worked with. And um, if if the con contractor is willing to work with the crew, you know, you you don't come in at 7:30 in the morning, kick on the radio, and and you know, be yelling back and forth. Those kinds of things make a huge difference to the neighbors, and it just takes communication with the contractor and an agreement with the contractor to manage the crew to be a little bit more considerate. So the, the only limitation we're gonna put is the six that they end at six o'clock at night. Agreed. And um, <coughs> then we're going to, to ask the, um, the applicant and the owner to work with the neighbors to try and um, lessen the impacts as much as is reasonably feasible to do. Um, okay, I think uh, the only last issue I'm certain as far as, uh, you know, things being watertight, again, that will, that will be taken care of under the normal construction um, uh, requirements. Uh, is there anything else that we're well, missing? Well, we still have to address the uh, 85 square for the third parking variance. Oh, okay. Well, personally, I'm not in favor of the 85 square feet. I thought we sort of addressed okay, that. Okay, as long as we're on it, I didn't know if we had a consensus, but I, I'm on the same page, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right, so it looks like we are ready for a motion if one of you want to do that. Well, I would move that we... Uh, approve this um, project uh, 180045 on Riverview at 318. Uh, we approve the variance for the uh, reduced parking for the two spots, that we approve the variance for the open space. Um, we are not approving the variance for the third parking spot uh, reduction, and that we add in the conditions that uh, we stop the work hours at six o'clock and that the applicant will work with uh, the neighbors to um, try to be reasonable in, in how they take care of both the work hours and logistics. And am I missing anything? And they but will work with the neighbors regarding the uh, new wall as far as oh, materials, the, the materials and materials on the new wall. Were you able to get that, Matt? So did, you, did you hit the uh, condition that the garage only be used for parking? Yes, and we, 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 we approved the variance for that, but not the third parking Thank spot. Thank you, we yeah. missed, yeah. 
So I just want to clarify my understanding is correct. What we're, what we're approving is a 2,000 square foot maximum size with two substandard width parking spaces. Correct. No correct. <laughs> and would you like it, the final design to come back to Planning Commission or be approved at the staff level? I don't. Uh, I, I think don't, staff I don't think so. could approve the final design. Okay. I'm okay, okay with that. Okay. So that was a motion. Are we? Okay, we need a second. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 So the motion carries unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you. And I'd just like for the minutes to reflect the representative's agreement with um, the discussion about working with the neighbors on the noise. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is item C concerning 2205 Wharf Road. This is a, a minor land division to create two lots of record and design permit for a new single family residence for the property located at uh, 2205 Wharf Road. Um, can we start with the staff report, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair Story, and good evening, Commissioners. Uh, before you this evening is a minor l land division um, for, a design for a new single family home on a separate parcel. Um, and this is located in, at 2205 Wharf Road in the multifamily low density zone. So um, this, this application came before you last year and it was approved in a different form. They've uh, redesigned the tentative map so that the two lots will now um, be oriented towards SoCal. It's still a shared driveway access that comes off of, uh, I'm sorry, yep, so off of Wharf Road, and but m modifications to the subdivision design. Also to note is that um, earlier this year, the city council adopted new design standards for subdivisions. So, uh, and we have a new zoning code which also applies to this so many of the standards that we saw in the last go around um, have changed so there are new things to pay attention to in this design and it is a whole new application the previous one was withdrawn um, so within this application the parcel in the back is parcel a and it's fourteen thousand and six square feet and parcel b is um, five thousand eight hundred forty seven square feet and as i mentioned they both have uh, frontage off of Wharf Road. And here's the building footprint of the new single family home that is proposed. Um, in terms of the updated code, there's no minimum lot size requirements, no minimum lot width or minimum lot depth requirements within the RMLM zone. So it gives a lot of flexibility to the uh, design standards when you're designing multifamily. The one standard that does need to be met is that within the RMLM, you have to have a minimum of 4,400 square feet per dwelling unit. So the lot in the back has is a triplex, and that is in compliance with the 13,200 square foot minimum. And then the lot in the front has a minimum square footage requirement of 4,400, and it goes beyond that at um, with the, the new lot size. Um, in your staff report, I had listed all the new or all of the design standards. The one standard that I will point out that it complies with, but um, so far as possible, it's the, the side lot lines so far as possible shall be at right angles to the street, which the lot faces or radial or approximate radial of the lot street, if the lot street is curved. So this is a unique uh, lot design in that it's a panhandled shape. It has frontage at right angles to Wharf Road, but the actual side lot lines are oriented towards the shared driveway. Um, and then something new within the design standards is standard H, which allows the Planning Commission to grant an exception to one or more of the design standards. And that didn't uh, previously exist. And um, 
really the way our zoning code is set up, you can make variance findings within the zoning code because this is in the subdivision ordinance. Um, we added a new standard for exceptions because there are unique circumstances in which exceptions are appropriate and um, so a new tool for the Planning Commission to support projects that need a, a small exception when appropriate. Uh, this image is an image of the lot. So the triplex, you can see the front of the triplex. Um, the fir tree to the right will be removed within this project. They are keeping the large, um, I think it's a redwood, I'm not sure, in the back there. And they've kind of designed the home to keep that tree and keep privacy between the triplex and the new single family home. And you can see the steep approach that comes into this property to the right. You can see how it goes down to Wharf Road. Um, all the setbacks requirements are met within the design permit. So their um, front yard setback of 15 feet and the 20 foot setback for the second story is met. Um, the rear yard is is met with a 20% regulation and then um, the side yards are also in compliance. And parking is also met within this application with a two car parking garage and an exterior space as well. With that, um, I'll go over the design with you. And the design has not changed since the first application. So on the south side, this is the side that will um, be oriented towards the shared driveway. Um, there's four inch window and, cor and corner trim. There's a 12 inch belly band around the building and the siding will be shingle. This is the elevation to the east that will face Wharf Road. This is the north. And this is the west elevation, which is on the rear, and that cutout in the middle there is the area in which you know the tree is oriented and there'll be a nice patio in the backyard. Um, here's an image, uh, an aerial image of Wharf Road. You can see how it curves as it's coming down and then 2205 Wharf Road. Um, in the latest application, the applicant submitted a a site visibility study as well as looking at the turning in and out of the driveway because of concerns that were brought up previously. Um, so as you can see when a resident leaves this property and takes a left hand turn onto Wharf Road it's pretty smooth you can get out there the visibility is challenging but if you're patient look both ways and see an opening you can make it. Um, and here that's showing that same left hand turn. Taking a right hand turn out of this driveway is dangerous and um, in the recommendations when this was looked at um, by their traffic engineer and then I also had Kim Lee Horn take a look at their traffic study and validate it. Um, they agreed with the recommendations. Um, so the right hand turn is, d is challenging. Since this um, application came in and the recommendations came in, um, their, the recommendation was uh, that to put up a sign that says no right hand turns out of the driveway. So the two recommendations was to eliminate right hand turns out of the driveway uh, through installing a no right hand turn sign on the driveway and then to replace the existing two foot diameter convex mirror with a three foot. So you can see here um, as you're leaving the driveway and before you get to the neighbors, um, the access area that crosses over the neighboring property the owner has put in a stop sign. They have the mirror, which will be enlarged, and they've put a no right-hand turn. Um, it's not quite at the point where you're down exiting the driveway, so I think that was probably done um, out of respect for the neighbor, I'm thinking, to not limit their turns, if, but, but that could be moved if, if you desired. Um, and also on this project, because it's a new subdivision and um, I'd like to add one more CEQA exemption. And the CEQA exemption is 151883, that the project is consistent with uh, the community plan, the general plan and zoning. And that's just stating that this, you know, it is located in a multifamily zone. Um, it was recognized that this parcel could be subdivided in the future and that no new or more severe cumulative impacts, nor were there any new substantial information, which was unknown at the time of the general plan EIR, 
was certified. So just to um, add, the, the pr other CEQA exemption was for subdivisions, but I thought it was appropriate where this is new development to add a second. So with that, um, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve this application based on the findings of fact, conditions of approval, and with the added CEQA exemption. The questions from commissioners? Yes, Deb. Uh, the additional parking that's in the uh, southeast corner, mm -hmm. whose parking is that? Um, I would have to defer to the applicant on that one, but it is located on the parcel that, that will be owned by the triplex, so I would assume it's parking for the well, triplex. Yeah, and that kind of leads, this isn't sort of a question, but the tentative map doesn't really very clearly tell us what easements exist, the parking being a good example. And when we get further along with this, it's, I think it needs to call out uh, exactly what easements are going to result from the subdivision of the property. Because that may be, for example, uh, the parking may be an easement for the triplex. Mm -hmm. Or may not. So that parking's on the triplex's property, right? Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's here's on the, the new it's on the triplex lot line, so it is on there. Mostly, yeah. Okay, maybe when we hear from the applicant, right. they'll clear that up for us. <coughs> any other questions, Deb? Any other commissioners have questions? No, I'd like to thank Katie for reminding us that uh, this zoning code area is approved. It's outside the Coastal Commission, so I think this is probably our first project with the new zoning code, right? Mm -hmm. So thanks well, for the so. reminder. Yeah. Uh, Katie, I did have a question about the location of the stop sign and the no right turn. Mm -hmm. um, uh, could you, I mean, it was, um, not put down at the intersection because of the adjacent? You know, I, I'll um, allow the owner to speak okay. to that, but when I went out to the site a couple days ago, I took these images, was happy to see the no right-hand sign up, but um, in the um, recommendation by the traffic engineer it said to place it in the driveway it didn't specify exactly where I uh -huh. believe the owner placed it here so his tenants would follow the rules of no taking right hand turn um, when Kimley Horn reviewed this they said that the suggestions within the report were good suggestions um, they said the no right hand turn will be a hard one for them to enforce because it's really up to the property <coughs> owner right uh, well, maybe the applicant could address that question when they come up. Um, but and seeing no more um, questions, co commissioners on the staff report, um, I will open it up uh, the public hearing for um, presentation. Hi, Dennis. Good evening, honorable <laughs> planning commissioners. Um, I'm Dennis Norton. I'm representing uh, Chris Wright, and you've seen this project before. Same house basically the same position and I want you to note that the house is designed around the redwood tree to save that tree it's a gorgeous tree and our intent is just to save that um, the uh, um, the process has been deep in this you know we've gone through every type of study imaginable to do this do this project um, it conforms to every one of your zoning and land use laws in the city of Capitola every one and um, I, I commend the the uh, the uh, staff are doing an excellent job on the staff report on this. I think it's well, well said and well, well, well taken care of. And with me, um, I have uh, uh, the owner uh, and Miles Cochran and Chris Ryder here. And if you have any questions, maybe they can answer that, the, the parking issue. And I know that there is deeded easements from one lot to the other and the other to the other. So they're both, they're both deeded back and forth. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Christopher Wright. I own the property. Um, I just first want to thank the planning department for the work uh, they've done to help us design it to meet the requirements. And as far as the two questions that came up, um, we did design it with two covered parking spaces and one uncovered that are shown on the plan. Uh, per the requirements as given us by the planning department. As far as the signs, the stop sign is placed <coughs> at the property line so that people would stop before they entered an area that intersects with the neighbors 
driveway area, and the right turn sign is placed there because that's where the pole is. Uh, to move it any farther forward, I would be on their property. Um, if they don't mind, I'm certainly happy to do that. If there's any questions, I'll answer them, but that is, that is the basic answer to that. Okay, all right, thank you. As far as the easements, we have drawn up easements for driveway access for property A over property B. And my attorney is here if you have any questions for him about those easements. All right, thank you. I just want to clarify, Chris, before you sit down, um, lot B has three parking places on lot B, so the, that uh, additional parking that Commissioner Newman was referring to is actually part of lot A. I'm not sure which additional parking you're referring it's to. The, Par dri the driveway come, comes up and there's two parking spaces over Maybe we here. Can, is, is there any way to put that yeah. up so everyone can the, see? There is a parking the pad point. at the front of uh, B's um, lot right. that is actually on A's property. There is an easement written to give B right to use it because parking, there's already seven parking spaces for property A, the triplex in the back. So when property A was remodeled, uh, we met the requirements for covered and uncovered parking for it. Okay. Those That's the space we were talking about. That area about. you're circling right there is a, is a cement parking pad and there's an easement for B to use it should they wish to, even though it's within A's property line. So and either A or B could use it? Um, technically, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Good evening. My name is Miles Dollinger. I'm an attorney for Chris Wright. I just wanted to comment on this parking on this parking pad. The way that we have drawn it up is for it to be an exclusive use park exclusive parking easement for parcel B. So, but okay. if, if any of you have an issue with that, um, we're open to another suggestion. But as Mr. Wright said, there's sufficient parking for the triplex. So we thought it made more sense to designate that area for extra parking for guests for parcel B. Thank you, Miles. And I can clarify that the triplex, there's a requirement for two spaces per unit and there are 10 spaces total, so by having eight there, mm -hmm. they'd be fine. Okay. Lots of parking. Uh, any other members of the public wish to address the commission on this item? Yes, sir, come on up. Good morning, uh, I'm interested, good evening. Uh, my name's Peter Taylor, I live at 2225 Wolf Road, which is the neighboring property that 2205 uses my driveway to access 2205. So I'm the next door neighbor that was involved in the last go around and uh, was ready to go to court about this until you change the rules to give yourselves the right to do what you're doing. So I'm here today to talk about safety. It has been my primary concern from the very beginning. Um, as you've just noted, there are 10 parking spots at the end of this between these two, prop the two lots, servicing four residents, the triplex and the house. And then you've got us, my house. So you're gonna have 12 cars jousting on a one lane road. This is not two lanes, this is one lane. When I was here before, one of the arguments given to support this project was that you have to give this landowner the same rights you've given other landowners on the road. And there are two other cases on the road very nearby where people do share driveway access. What was not mentioned is both of those are 20 feet wide and allow for two-way traffic. My driveway allows for one lane traffic if anybody's even parking down at the mailbox to get their mail or clean the brush away from the mailbox, it's forget about it. You're not getting up my driveway. You gotta go around the block and park and wait until they get out of the way. 
So, and as the traffic study said, and if you read that traffic study again, there are a lot of qualifications in that. As you all know, Wharf Road is a dangerous road. People drive over the speed limit. I can't tell you how many near misses there have been. It's not a question of if there's going to be an accident. There is going to be an accident. The question is just when and how tragic is it going to be. This is not the only option Mr. Wright has. He could have put in a two-lane driveway. It would have been right in the middle of the sea if you look at the turn, the cor curve in Wharf Road, and you have perfect visibility in both directions. As it is where the driveway is right now, you can see pretty good down to, you know, where the freeway is. But the library, forget about it. And anybody trying to make that turn as you've been talking about, that right turn out of there, if they came down nose first, is a tragedy waiting to happen, both for the person coming the other way and the person who tries to do it, because there's no way they're going to do it. They're going to go over the yellow line. <coughs> I definitely want to say one thing. I appreciate the fact that Mr. Wright put up the stop sign. I appreciate that he put up a no right turn sign. But people don't listen. They blow right through it. There's nothing up there to say what is the safe speed on which to exit Wolf Road onto the property. If you go and look at that, somebody coming from the freeway, coming down Wolf Road, the speed limit on Wolf Road is 25, supposedly. People are usually going faster. Somebody could turn, take this access, they got a straightaway for over 120 feet before they're going to have to make a turn. They don't necessarily slow down. They come whoop, right through there. I've already lost one pet run over by somebody going in next door. Um, so it really is inherently dangerous. I challenge any of you that if it was your driveway and every day you were running the gauntlet, because that's what we feel like it is, we get in our car, we're listening. Is somebody starting a car next door? We don't just back down our driveway. There's, we're not, we don't have any stop sign. But we always stop and look because we just don't trust them. And we're going to get hurt. So the guy had an option. You could have made him put in a driveway like anybody else. Two lanes up along the Woolsey circle fence, orientation the right way to the road, everything per your old code, although now you've changed the code, you can do what you're doing. But that would have been safe. Two lanes in and out and great visibility in both directions. Instead, you got 10 cars there. My daughter's at our house a lot of the time, so there's three cars at our place. 13 cars with one lane access. It's just not dangerous. So the question I've got for you is, in the city of Capitola, when would you say it was unsafe? How many residences can share a one lane driveway before you say, eh, Time out, no, dangerous, you can't do it. I would posit to you that it's at least something seven or over. Because if you go look at what you forced them to do at Woolsey Circle, it's a two-lane road. It's even got the sidewalk with the lights and everything else so they can cross the road safely. But that's two lanes. And that's seven residences. Mr. Wright's putting in four if you count the triplex in his house. And it's all being a one-lane road down my throat. My family's, uh, if somebody's going to get hit, it's most probably going to be us. If they're coming home, they've got perfect visibility. They're coming out, they have perfect visibility. The people who have no visibility are us. And it's our driveway. And we've had no input in this at all. So I beg you, please don't do this. Somebody's going to get hurt. The main reason I'm down here today is I d really don't think you're going to listen to me at all. You didn't listen to me the last time, and I have law on my side then, is I want it on the record. I've done everything I can to stop this and make it safe. And I'm going to fail. But at least it's going to be on the record that I did everything I could to get somebody to listen. This is not safe. Do the right thing. Go over there. Look at yourself. Go try it yourself. Believe me, you're going to go. I'm dealing with this every day. And on top of it, if you do make, if you looked at that drawing that Katie had up there about how if you don't make the right turn, you've got to make the left turn. Huh. Good.
Good luck doing that at, at least four of the hours of every day. There's no way, you're going to be sitting there sometimes five, ten minutes waiting to get that break in action in both directions that's safe for you to cross the road. You know, to cut across, and get in that lane without somebody coming down from the library at a high rate of speed around that corner. I appreciate the signage. I appreciate the, you know, the um, positive intent. I'm not against Mr. Wright developing this property. But, you know, there were other choices here. He could have put in his own driveway. Initially, when that, this first came up, the reason it was given that he didn't put in his own driveway was excessive grading. Give me a break. You can go around this town and you can see way more challenging retaining walls than what would be required here. So you have the right to make this decision. Go right ahead. But appreciate one day, and it may not be that far in the future, the shit's going to hit the fan when somebody gets killed or hurt out there because, and then the people say, oh, this is unsafe. How could you have done this? So right. it's interesting. I've asked many people this question, and I've never gotten an answer. There is nowhere in your regulation that defines what's unsafe in terms of a one-lane daisy chain driveway, however you would like to characterize this. <coughs> and I would say to you, you've got to believe that at some level, it is unsafe. You sure as hell couldn't have the Riverview Apartments in a situation like that. And you didn't allow it at Woolsey Circle. And there's seven residences here. But five residents seems to be OK. And I would say that that is foolishness. It's not doing the right thing. <coughs> the main purpose, I would say, of you people is to make sure that the city has regulations that make for a safe environment for all of us. I'll give you one more minute, Peter, to wrap up. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Can I ask him a question? Uh, oh, yeah, if you're willing, Peter. Uh, Commissioner Newman has yeah. a question. This is not about the safety. I was just curious. When you are leave your house and get to the road and you want to go to the village, what, how do you do it? You mean if I want to come down like t tonight? Yeah. Normally what I'll do, because I used to work in, uh, at Seabright, and I'd leave at 6.30 in the morning. Weren't very many people up at that day. At that time, I would back down my driveway to where you know, the, the, it goes through to go to the next door property. Stop, listen, windows down, look, nothing coming. And I back down my driveway. There is enough space there without, you know, without running into the mailboxes or being in the bike lane where you can actually back down, get there safe. And sometimes that's the only way we can leave the property. At 3.30 in the afternoon or when school gets out, there's no way you're getting two ways clear to be safe to cut, get out. It's just not, it's not happening. So at certain times of the day, if you want to leave, the only safe way to do it from our house is to back down. And if I ever have any guests at my house, I back their car down my driveway. I never let them get out. The first question to them is, which way are you going? If it's at the time of day where it's really dangerous, I don't even ask the question. I just tell them, I'm not letting you try and clear two lanes of traffic to get out of here. I'm going to back the car down. You're going to walk down the driveway. I'm going to get you in the car, and you're going to drive straight out towards the library. And I'll tell you this. When I get time to sell my house, you bet your life, the big disclaimer everywhere in selling my property is how dangerous Wolf Road is. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. Miles, are you going to speak to the safety issue? I'll give you two minutes. Um, okay, just a few points then. Um, I think um, although there might be 12 parking spaces on the two properties combined, that certainly doesn't mean there's going to be 12 cars there at any one time. And certainly there's not going to be 12 cars moving in and out at the same time. Another point is that there actually, there's two safety issues. One is the safety of traffic coming on and off Warp Road. And one is the safety of cars going up and down the driveway. Uh, th the safety issue on Wharf Road, I think, is a legitimate one raised by planning staff, which is why they asked Mr. Um, Wright to have this traffic study done, which he did, and the traffic consultant concluded that the uh, conditions going on and off Wharf Road are 
acceptable as long as people don't make a right turn. So I think that issue has been addressed. If there's a safety issue up and down the driveway between the residents on the subject property, I think that's an issue between them and they're gonna be going slow and it's, it's uh, I don't think that's much, th that should be a concern of the commission. It's between the residents of the property. Also, uh, Mr. Taylor claims that there were, uh, was an alternative for to build a new driveway up the right side of the property, which really isn't true. In addition to grading being an issue, there's a gas line and a sewer line in that area that made it not feasible to build a new driveway in that area. Thank you. All right, thank you, Miles. Uh, anyone else wish to address the commission on this item? Seeing none, I'm going to close the public hearing. I'll bring it to commissioners. Um, and I'd like to maybe begin by asking staff, um, do we have any record of uh, the history of accidents uh, either on that driveway or along that section of Wharf Road? I recall that the last time this proposal was reviewed that we hadn't, there was no record of accidents right off of this driveway. Okay, so. that, that's I think, believe what I recall uh, mm -hmm. from, from then. Um, and f from staff's awareness, what is the jurisdiction of this commission uh, to deal with questions of safety um, as long as a project otherwise uh, meets our you know, zoning code and, uh, and ordinances. Um. Yeah, um, so when this project came in, it was also um, the perspective of our public works department that it would be safer to have one entrance here that is shared rather than put another entrance along this curved portion of Wharf Road. Mm -hmm. um, so we really lean on technical experts for the safety of, of information regarding access and that is why we had the study done and reviewed um, but really it's the information that we provide you but the criteria that you're looking at within a subdivision ordinance and with the design permit tonight um, we should consider all facts that are in front of us but we understand that you're not the expert and we you depend on the experts report all right thank you um, Commissioners wish to, you know, uh, begin yeah. discussion on this. Yes, Susan. As, as far as the safety goes, you know, in um, in the traffic report, um, you know, they indicate that um, um, the driveway onto Wharf Road is already deficient, uh, but that uh, its deficiency is unrelated to the addition of traffic from one new single-family house which is what we're looking at is one house, not uh, adding uh, six or seven houses on the driveway. Uh, so it's, it's how much of an impact that one additional house would, would have on it. And as the traffic engineer says, um, you know, that, that traffic is not going to change uh, any deficiencies that already exist there. Um, so for me, I, you know, this is a project that we've looked at before, I think got approved before, and, um, uh, you know, I, I agree it's, it's not an ideal situation. I don't pretend to be a traffic engineer and, and, and try and solve traffic problems or answer questions about how many houses can be on, you know, one, one lane driveway. Um, at, at this point in time, we've gotten information from them that if they put up the signage and they don't allow the right-hand turn, um, then it, it would be an adequate situation. So I'm inclined to support the project. All right, thank you, Susan. Um, any other commissioners wish to weigh in? Uh, <coughs> well, since you're looking my direction, I guess I'll jump in here. Um, I actually had some heartburn with this last time. I think Mr. Wright's done his due diligence in, in, um, in uh, putting up the sign and, and taking a look at it. I don't think you have to be a traffic engineer to s tell the, if I assume you, like I did, have been to that property many times now, um, to see that's an unsafe exit and entrance into the, that, uh, those houses. It's, it doesn't require much thinking in, in the process. It's unsafe, that's the bottom line. Um, 
However, looking at what's before us today, um, that's not part of the, our, our purview to, to have that discussion and really that decision. So based on um, what we're looking at, uh, I, I'm in uh, agreement that I would uh, support this proposal. Anyone else? I'm just going to um, thank mm -hmm. Peter for coming down and making, you know, raising the awareness of the dangers of Wharf Road. And it's not um, limited to Wharf Road. As the community gets more crowded and has more traffic, people need to slow down. Um, on Wharf Road, I live in a similar situation where people come off of, of um, what is, I guess, Capitola Wharf Road onto Prospect Avenue and kind of a Y and they do it at high speeds and some of them go around my corner on two wheels and I want to go out and put speed bumps in except I'm afraid they'd launch the cars. <laughs> um, but I think that the property owner has done due diligence on um, doing the best job with the property that he can to develop it in a responsible way. If, if he were here before us asking for seven houses, I think um, we'd be saying no. But the addition of a single family dwelling on that property, I think, is a good, a good use of the land. And um, that's what we paid traffic engineers for, um, to tell us what is safe and what is not safe, what is adequate and what is not adequate. And in this case, I have to yield to the experts. Right. Um, yeah, Ed. So this project's been a long, long, long time in its uh, development here, and I think they've done put a great effort into trying to solve all the problems that they had to deal with along the way. This being the second application, or at least the second application, um, the only issue there is that I can see is is the uh, traffic. Uh, entrance onto Wharf Road, and um, we all agree it's not ideal. Uh, the problem is that the traffic uh, the behavior on Wharf Road is not ideal, um, and we have a library going in there, so we need to look at other uh, approaches to making that more safer because uh, when we have a new library, uh, we're going to just increase the amount of traffic. I, and so. It needs to be addressed in a way other than um, not allowing uh, otherwise uh, an application that otherwise satisfies all the requirements. I, I was curious about with the no right hand turn how that's going to work because I mean when you turn left then where do you go? I mean if you want to go to Capitola Village um, it's a long way around uh, or you find some place to turn around and so I'm not sure where we're. It, it still may uh, be see, faster I than. See, I was right. thinking it wasn't that bad because you just go down, turn on Wharf, you turn back on Bay Avenue and come back in, mm -hmm. and sometimes that's a lot easier than actually trying to drive through. The yeah, that's itself. one way to do it, and it also really backs up on that. What's the name of that little street there that goes? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I can see that people are going to have some way of turning left and then uh, turning around somewhere. But I don't. I don't know where. Where? I don't know where they're going to yeah. turn around. Yeah, I know. It's so uh, people are creative. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, again, I, I have the reservations that all the commissioners have. That uh, it would be great if the wharf road weren't what it is in terms of the curvy uh, road that people drive too fast on. But that's not a reason for denying this application, in my opinion, given the traffic study. Yeah, and, and, and I'm going to concur with uh, those statements. Um, um, I really don't think development standards or decisions should be based upon um, uh, other persons uh, violating the law, speeding on the Wharf Road. Um, um, with that said, um, I know that that is a consistent and perennial issue, but to me that's an issue of enforcement and maybe the city needs to do a better job of doing enforcement, doing design and engineering on F Wharf Road to fix that condition. Um, and I don't think that we should transfer those responsibilities to private property owners by denying or, or, or imposing upon them 
the duties to, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, address other individuals' violation of the of the laws, the speeding laws on Wharf Road. Um, we know that it's not ideal, uh, but everyone knows what they're getting into, um, and we have many streets where you have to navigate one-way traffic, um, and we learn to do it. We learn how to be safe. We learn to coexist in a small community, and um, as much as I appreciate Peter coming down and expressing his views um, uh, and making us aware of it, I don't think it's um, uh, uh, sufficient for us to deny an otherwise uh, uh, compliant project. So with that, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move um, approval of the project 18-0108 um, based on the findings and conditions stated in the staff report and plus the additional CEQA exemption. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Yeah, there's a motion and second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Which takes us to item six on tonight's agenda, which is a director's report on uh, retail marijuana sales and regional commercial zoning district. Um, and this is uh, concerning a future amendment to the Capitola's, Capitola zoning code um, to allow retail cannabis sales within the regional commercial zoning district with a conditional use permit. Um, you want to fill us in, Katie? Yes. Um, thank you. Um, first, I just want to say it's really good to be here and be sitting in this seat before you this evening and giving you a director's report. So uh, thank you for uh, being so welcoming over the past couple weeks with Rich's departure. We're already missing him, but um, it feels really good to be here and in this role, so appreciate the opportunity to continue serving you. Um, so before you this evening, I'm gonna give you an overview. Uh, this was provided to City Council um, a few weeks back, and just a real overview of what we're, what we're anticipating for the marijuana ordinance update and the timing, and essentially this will be going to the public vote, so it'll be up to the residents of Capitola whether or not uh, marijuana will become available as a retail sale within the city. So, quick overview, 1996, um, Prop 215, miracle, uh, medical marijuana was approved. In 2014, the city ban for commercial and cultivation process took place. Um, 2016, Prop 64, uh, the voters approved recreational marijuana in the state of California. In 2017, we updated our uh, ordinance to be specific that commercial marijuana uses were still banned with the exception of laboratories. There used to be a laboratory in our industrial zone that uh, was doing chemistry work on looking at marijuana. And then in 2018, the council asked staff to consider retail sales within the regional commercial zone. So where this will be looked at is within the new regional commercial zone um, north of Capitola Road. So anticipated regulatory process, this is, um, it's gonna affect different parts of the municipal code. So several new amendments are needed. First, uh, chapter 9.61 for marijuana sales, process and cultivation. The change would be to allow sales as a, as allowing retail sales where right now it's prohibited. Um, they'll be included in that chapter 9.61, a new marijuana licensing ordinance. So that would be at the purview of the police department as well as the city council. Um, and then amending the zoning code to allow marijuana sales as a conditional use permit within the regional commercial zone and a new marijuana tax ordinance within chapter three under uh, for revenues and finance and also amending the fee schedule so like i stated previously this would be up to the voters um, all the changes would be contingent on uh, the tax measure passing within the in the november election so because of that we're on a really tight times frame so in uh, we've got an august deadline for the ballot measure so at our next meeting, I'll be coming back to you with a proposed 
zoning ordinance change. So this slide here kind of shows the different parts of the municipal code that will be affected. The portion that will come to you is the zoning, so uh, limited to the regional commercial. It'll be a conditional use permit, so members of the public can come in and comment before any conditional use permit is um, is issued by the or approved by the Planning Commission, and it'll be tied to conditions and findings. Um, the retail permit will be the retail cannabis permit. This is where we're really going to rely on our police heavily to um, maintain these retailing permits. So rather than us revoking the permit as a CUP, which can be a challenge, if there's an issue with a, a marijuana retailer, the police will have the ability within their retailing permit to revoke a permit, which is much easier, much more easily done than a planning permit. So um, within that permit, we'll utilize best practices. Um, it'll, the owner, the permit will be tied to the owner and not the actual property owner, but the owner of the business, or both if they own the building. But, um, and then it'll be revocable and suspendable by the police department. And then, of course, the tax measure, which will be on the November ballot. Um, so here is an outline of the process, and we were directed by the council to proceed with the ballot initiative. Um, next meeting in front of the Planning Commission, I'll have a draft zoning code for you, zoning ordinance change to our new zoning ordinance. This is outside of uh, the coastal zone, so it's a change to the new, the new code. Uh, City Council in June will, ha will hold their first reading of the draft ordinance on June 28th. And then in July, the City Council will hold the second reading. We'll have a work session just follow a week following our June 7th meeting. We'll have a work session with the City Council to review the drafts to all the different sections of the Municipal Code, and they'll hear your recommendation at that point. Um, the ballot measure deadline is August 10th, so we would like to make sure we get that second reading done in July. Um, and then voters will consider the ballot in November, and then if the voters pass, the tax initiative, then the um, new retail sa sales ordinance would come into effect in January. And at that point, we'd be accepting applications for the, the retail permit. A um, couple like bigger picture items of the taxes. The current marijuana taxes at the state level, there's a standard tax of 9% plus a 15% marijuana sales tax, which results in a 24% tax at the state level before it even comes to the local level. Um, in putting this on the ballot, um, the research that's been done, most cities and counties charge between a 5 and a 10% local tax. There's an estimate of 200000 to 300000 annually in tax revenues that would come in per business. Um, the, our proposed tax measure that will go before city council and then out to the voters would be a not to exceed tax of 10% on the November ballot. And the actual amount will be set by the city council. This is how both the county and the city have operated. Um, they've done a not to exceed 10%. Currently, the city of Santa Cruz is at 8%, and the county tax is at 7%. So it just gives us some flexibility um, in where to put the taxing amount. And then the revenue could be used in part to offset, of course, any impacts or service demands from the, the new retail sales. Um, and then ultimately, as I said, it, it's up to the Capitola voters whether or not retail sales would occur within the city. Um, so zoning amendments, we um, I've looked at quite a few different jurisdictions. And um, in discussing this, with the police chief as well, a couple of the, our suggestions would be to limit the use to the regional commercial zone, um, require a 1,000 foot path of travel buffer between schools and churches. Under California state law, there's a 600 foot buffer. Um, then also include a 500 foot buffer between retailers. This was really something that the chief of police requested in order to kind of distribute these and not, not have an area of high concentration of um, retail cannabis, cannabis establishments. And then another rule is that the, each um, location would have to have an, in, an independent exterior access point so that we couldn't have a retailer that came into the mall 
and we wouldn't have to worry about say a shared access where there's cannabis and then like a children's toy store or something where the mixes just really don't line up so uh, having making sure they have an independent access and you see that in a lot of the codes that have been written um, and then of course requiring a conditional use permit and a retail marijuana license from locally and then they must comply with all the state um, and all the state requirements as well and um, so the retail cannabis permit this is what would be adopted by the city council and enforced by the police department um, the permits would be issued by the police we they're going to consider allowing a maximum of anywhere between one and three businesses that will be established uh, by the city council um, as determined by the city council and then permits would run with the business not with the property and permits would be issued on a competitive merit-based system so legal retail experience civil and criminal records would be looked at operations and security plans residency so for local residents would have preference um, also security measures there would be security best practices which would be uh, conditions of a permit of a retailing permit so that as we learn the as we learn more about what the uh, challenges are with a retail establishment these can change over time and the police chief can um, put in new measures as needed so this would take a look at alarm systems um, have required cameras and remote monitoring certified security personnel being on site perimeter lighting for after hours hardened point of sale with security and bulletproof glass uh, live scan background checks for all employees premises subject to law enforcement inspections no products that are attractive to children um, no products that are resealable they have to be child resistant tamper evident and labeled appropriately and then minors under 21 would not be allowed on the premise and that is a state law um, and also requiring incorporation of best practices for physical security measurements uh, best practices to restrict the sales of items or labeling attractive to children um, they can staff may revoke or suspend a cannabis permit for cause so this is why we'll put that language in the uh, cannabis retailing permit and then the business is subject to periodic review by the police department and community development department and then of course compliance with the CEP standards um, so with that um, that completes my presentation and uh, any discussion you'd like to have uh, about the um, standards that we're proposing within the zoning code or any concerns or anything you'd like me to come back with when the draft is in front of you I have a question um, it, you mentioned that City Council is going to estab establish a maximum quantity of businesses in Capitola um, and one to three is that's good did you calculate how many businesses would be would fit in the zone at 500 feet apart I haven't done so but I know from um, Capitola Road to like Auto Plaza Drive is over 2,000 feet so and also Claire Street's included and Auto Plaza Drive in the okay. regional commercial so I think there's quite a f you could easily have three um, with a 500 foot buffer and um, they can't have a shared access so using the example of the mall we've had um, you know the Sears building come in and talk about splitting it up and and having two um, tenants that have exterior uh, entries mm -hmm. would they be allowed to be in that kind of a location uh, based on what you're um, talking about we could draft it if, if we didn't want any of the mall properties to be allowed to have it we could draft it that way but no under that scenario where the, uh, to the in within the Sears proposal there's no internal connection between the buildings they would be able to if if we simply said that you just need to have a separate access well one of those units would have access into the mall um, and an exterior independent access so in That's that in that I'm case asking. we would not allow would it, not allow it. Okay. You know. um, they had also talked about uh, putting some pads up toward 41st Avenue 
toward Capitola Road. Mm -hmm. It would seem like to me that those pads would be permissible for uh, a marijuana dispensary. So that would be, yeah, yes. well. Yeah. Or like um, the Takara restaurant. Similar, you're right. Yeah, Similar that, that would be that. permissible because I mean, it's one it entrance. Ver yeah, mm -hmm. very prominent, very one of the first things somebody may see going down 41st Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I assume the city council will be grappling with some of those uh, kind of aesthetic and um, Yeah, there's issues. been concern um, for signage that's been voiced at the city council about whether or not to allow the green crosses. Um, and there, it's not a requirement by the state that they have a green cross. So, you know, there is flexibility in that. Um, but then we also have to um, think about First Amendment rights and freedom of speech, so mm -hmm. of what they're allowed. Um, but there, we can have s sign standards for these, and we can talk about whether or not we allow logos and that type of thing. In, in discussions with this, if we were not to allow the green crosses, um, what uh, you have to think of what would come in if the green cross wasn't allowed. So what, what do we really want to regulate in that aspect? But so will there be any design review aspect of this, like with a normal uh, business? I mean, one of my concerns would be that we don't want to have buildings that, you know, have bars all across the windows <laughs> and, uh, you know, look like it's some sort of vault. I mean, uh, normally we do have a design review process, so I'm assuming uh, if people were going to do exterior changes like that to a building, they would still have to get a design review permit. If they were going to add bars to the windows and make significant changes like that, yes, they would need a design permit. We can clarify that within the way it's drafted. And you might wind up with somebody who wants to, you know, come in and build a building on a pad around the mall and build it for that purpose. So there should be a design review for mm -hmm. You know, there's so many of these. In Santa Cruz and in the county now, I, somehow this seems like overkill to me, but it's okay. I mean, the only, and the part that I really don't like is this uh, childproof uh, packaging when an adult can't get in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought the one. same thing. It's very too. humiliating. <laughs> 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 you know, they used to make the lid so you, that you could uh -huh. but when you eliminate that pharmacy, hole. They turn you it upside can ask down. Them now, not to give you a childproof lid uh -huh. because you can open up. Yeah. So. That's a minor point. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> if it were a new building on a new pad, it would definitely require a design permit. Right. So. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for that, and we'll we'll stay tuned. Very good. Um, um, which brings us to Commissioner Communications. Any communications? Um, well, I was just going to welcome Katie. She's already jumped on that, but yes. yeah. It's yeah, good, to, good to have, have you here. stay here. So, <laughs> we are. Yeah. Well, congratulations on your first meeting. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> and applying our, our new zoning code. Um, so, with that, that brings us to adjournment, and I'll adjourn this meeting to the next uh, meeting in June of the Planning Commission. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.